alive. Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. It's a slim volume mysteriously titled The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, and it is arguably one of the most influential works of the 20th century. Henry Ford believed it was a wake-up call for America. Winston Churchill was once convinced it was true. The Nazis used it as a warrant for genocide. This is the story of a hoax that will not die. It has fooled millions of people all over the world for more than a century and continues to be a powerful force of evil and hate. Join us as we go in search of history to uncover a deadly deception. January 1922, Walter Rathenau, Germany's Minister of Foreign Affairs, a Jew, is assassinated in Berlin by Hermann Fischer and an accomplice. At trial, they declare that Rathenau had to be killed because he was one of the elders of Zion. But who are the elders of Zion? According to this book, the elders of Zion are an elite group of Jewish leaders whose sole purpose is to take over the world by controlling the hearts, minds, and money of the Gentile world. And the book purports to quote directly from this invented group of Jewish leaders. Throughout all Europe and in other continents also, we must create riots, discord, and hostility, but we must use great cunning so the non-Jews will accept us as their benefactors and the saviors of the human race. These words are quoted from a mysterious little book that first starts circulating underground in Russia around 1897. It is titled, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Its author and origin are unknown to this day. The Protocols, as the book is commonly called, contains the minutes of a clandestine meeting held by a group of Jewish leaders, the so-called Learned Elders of Zion. Through the minutes, Readers learn that the elders' sole purpose is to infiltrate every corner of society with the ultimate aim of world conquest. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion purport to be the verbatim, word-for-word -word, uh, record of 24 speeches that were delivered by the uh, so-called Chief Sage of Zion to a secret meeting that took place in Switzerland in, in 1897. They describe a very uh, terrifying conspiracy to take over the world, to destroy particularly Christian nations, and to uh, build upon the ruins a Jewish empire ruled by a Jewish despot. From the moment of its publication, the protocol spread like an incurable virus across the European continent. Germany's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Walter Rathenau, is only one of millions of victims to come. Real victims of a deadly deception. Because everything about the protocols of the learned elders of Zion is a hoax. The book is a fake. There is no such group as the elders of Zion. The meeting never happened. The minutes are all made up. And yet this book was used and is still used as a justification for hate and it is part of a web of lies that grew over centuries and starts, many believe, with the books of the New Testament. One is the Gospel of John, where he puts in the mouth of Jesus the following sentence. Jesus speaking to the Jews. He says, those who claim they are Jews, I tell them you are not. Your father is the devil, and you fulfill his wishes on earth. Very simply here. Your father is the devil, and you fulfill his wishes on earth. Not thinking, that if he says the father of the Jews is the devil, the father of Christ also would be the devil. Then, in medieval times, the demonization of the Jews has reached a fever pitch. But it wasn't until 1797 that what was essentially a religious prejudice turned into a political one. 
It happened through the writings of a French cleric, Abbé Barul, during a period of paranoia and social chaos following the French Revolution. Barul blames the Jews for all of France's ills. It is the design of that terrible and formidable sect to overthrow all thrones, all altars, annihilate all property, efface all law, and end by dissolving all society. Barul's theme of a secret Jewish plot to conquer the world quickly becomes a staple in late 18th century European literature. Conspiracy theories are popular, and the Jews are an easy target. If there hadn't been a vast anti-Semitic literature that preceded the protocols, they would have meant nothing. But because the European population had been prepared for this by decades of talk about a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world, then the protocols fit into that, made sense, and were scary. By the mid-19th century, the idea of a worldwide Jewish conspiracy is well established. In 1868, Hermann Goethe writes Biarritz, an anti-Semitic novel under the more respectable pen name of Sir John Redcliffe. Biarritz is especially significant because of one scene in which Jewish leaders conduct a secret meeting in a Prague cemetery. Thirty years later, that same exact setting appears in a new document, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. But this time, it's not said to be fiction. It's purported to be true. The protocols had a particular impact because they were alleged to be a first-hand document. There was not a report about something. It was the actual something itself. And because it was understood to be this first-hand report, it had far more of an impact than would otherwise have been the case. The protocols look like and contain the same kind of language found in real meeting minutes at the turn of the century. They outline in a seemingly business-like manner the 24 steps to Jewish world domination. Even document experts who analyze the protocols when they first come out are fooled into believing the manuscript is real. We shall soon begin to establish huge monopolies, reservoirs of colossal riches upon which even the large fortunes of non-Jews will depend to such an extent that they will go down on the day after the political revolution. It was phenomenal. It turned people's heads. There's report after report of people saying, I didn't know that this sort of thing was taking place. It was very powerful. In addition to its authentic look, the Protocols also pretends to name names, and some of the names in the document are those of real Jewish leaders. Theodor Herzl is listed as the chief sage of the elders of Zion. This was a particularly clever deception because the same year that the Protocols were released, the real Theodor Herzl was in Basel, Switzerland, leading the First World Jewish Congress. He is the chief uh, sage, which would make sense, of course, since the uh, protocols are supposedly uh, were delivered uh, at the uh, Basel Congress, so the first Zionist Congress. The document is so powerful, in fact, that although the protocols has been proven to be a hoax on at least 10 different occasions during its 100-year history, many people who read it still believe the document is real and the words in it are true. Who could create such a powerful deception? And why was the Protocols created in the first place? St. Petersburg, Russia is ground zero for the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. And to understand how and why the Protocols came to exist, you have to examine what is happening in Russia at the time the fake document is created in 1897. It is the eve of the Russian Revolution. It was an age of crisis. In times of crisis, people and need some sort of explanation for what's going on. And that's, of course, one of the things about the Jewish world conspiracy is that nothing that's going on in the modern world cannot be explained by the sinister nature of, of what the Jews are up to. Within the government, Tsar Nicholas II is torn between two opposing factions. The liberal reformers want to establish a political dialogue with the Bolsheviks, the leaders of the burgeoning revolution. 
The conservative right is strongly opposed and begins a secret campaign to discredit the liberals. Since many of the Tsar's liberal ministers and their Bolshevik counterparts are Jews or have strong ties to Jewish business interests, creation of the protocols provides a convenient yet imaginary reason to fear the left. It was never meant to be harmless. It always had a political purpose and uh, I think a destructive political purpose in almost every case. Perhaps at the origins, the very origins, it had no, nothing more to it than an attempt to uh, influence the sort of minor personnel decisions of, of the Tsar, Nicholas II, the, the weak-willed the weak Nicholas II. Some have theorized that it was trying to put some spine and that he should come down hard on his enemies like the elders of Zion would if they were in his place. No one knows for certain, but the circumstantial evidence strongly suggests that the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion is created by the Okhrana, the Russian secret police. A right-wing faction controls the Okhrana, a group that has the will and the means to create a persuasive forgery. The person overseeing it for the, the Russian Okhrana commissioned other such works to discredit uh, political enemies or political threats. That person is Pyotr Ivanovich Rakovsky, who directs the Okhrana foreign offices. He is a master forger who equips his agents with false documents so they can infiltrate subversive organizations and destroy them from within. And most compelling of all, Rakovsky has a history of blaming Jews for everything. In 1892, five years before the release of the Protocols, Rakovsky uses the pen name Jean Preval and publishes Anarchy et Nihilisme, a small pamphlet outlining the very same ideas that will appear in the Protocols five years later. In 1897, it seems, he improves on the original by removing the author's name altogether and making his work look exactly like a real document. It is then disseminated to a number of key conservative organizations. There's a very great allure that the secret document has. If you're in Washington and you want to get the news out, you do a lot better by leaking a secret document than by m making your views just directly uh, available. Uh, everybody's interested in a secret. And when it is such a tremendous secret, a secret about plans to take over the world, well, it's irresistible. The protocol spread slowly but surely in conservative circles. Then, in 1903, there is an explosion. The version of the protocols purportedly authored by Rakowski is released publicly, published in a St. Petersburg newspaper. The editor is Pavlachi Khrushchevan, an ardent fascist and anti-Semite, whose editorials have just sparked a riot in the Russian city of Kishnev. Forty-five Jews are killed, and more than 1,300 Jewish homes and shops are destroyed. As soon as Khrushchevan receives the fraudulent protocols of the learned elders of Zion, he publishes it as fact. The evil genie is now out of the bottle. We will undermine the sources of production by instilling in the workmen ideas of anarchy and encouraging them in the use of alcohol, at the same time taking measures to drive all the intellectual forces of the Gentiles from the land. They were a confession that did not intend to be a confession. It was what the Jews never would have said in public, but among their own kind, they could make these claims. As a result, it had enormous persuasive effect if you were once willing to grant the fact that this far-fetched forgery was real. Khrushchevan also publishes cheap editions of the protocols in pamphlet form for mass distribution and joins with other militant anti-Semites to form the Union of Russian People, also known as the Black Hundreds. They begin to commit acts of terror and assassination against Jewish liberals and radicals. By scapegoating the Jews, Khrushchevan achieves power and fame, and this does not go unnoticed by others seeking the same. And one of these men has the ear of the Tsar. Sergei Nilas is a third-string advisor in the court of Nicholas and Alexandra. He is welcomed at court because he is a celebrity, a Christian mystic who has written The Great in the Small, 
a best-selling autobiography about his transformation from middle-class atheist to an enlightened spokesman for God. In the first years of the 20th century, many mystics are regular visitors to the court of the Romanovs, but they are all mere shadows compared to the overbearing presence of Rasputin, Tsarina Alexandra's personal spiritual advisor and confidant. Sergei Nilas is desperate to make a name for himself and presents the protocols to the Tsar as a true and authentic document. The protocols make a very deep impression on the Tsar. What depth of thought, what foresight! Our year 1905 has gone as though managed by the elders. There can be no doubt as to their authenticity. In 1905, a version of the protocols is published with the imprint of the Imperial Palace. The Orthodox Church in Moscow orders the protocols included in a sermon. On October 16, 1905, parishioners in 368 churches throughout the city of Moscow hear the protocols recited by their priests. The fact that the, you have the protocols read in all kinds of Orthodox churches in Russia by their priests, they are integrating now the protocols of Elder Zion like if it would be any other uh, uh, text written in antiquity, like uh, the Book of Revelation. Now we are in another time of, of crisis like that, and here is a document which has the validity, which proves what we have been saying over 1800 years, that uh, the Jews are Antichrist people, the armies of Antichrist. Three weeks after the sermons begin, on November 8, 1905, more than 1,000 Jews are massacred in the Russian city of Odessa. It is a harbinger of atrocities to come. The reason I'm doing this is because uh, of what I read here, and uh, you have this coming. Uh, that is to say, uh, people intelligent enough to read books and to, uh, sometimes to write books, I think they find the protocols useful and informative and authentic. As Russia moves ever closer to revolution in the decade before World War I, the political right has finally succeeded in its original intent. The protocols of the learned elders of Zion has demonized the left. It is now politically correct to hate Jews and to denounce socialists and communists as puppets of the worldwide Jewish conspiracy. It's not surprising that the empirical evidence, that is the Jewish sounding names among the Bolshevik leadership, and there were many, Trotsky being the most famous of them, was proof that this was a Jewish conspiracy. And that is, incidentally, what made the protocols believable, I think, uh, right up and through the Holocaust, and maybe beyond the Holocaust. That is to say, the association, the popular association of Jews with the left, and particularly with, the, uh, with communism. It was somehow comforting for non-Jews, I guess, to think that this odious worldview, this godless and dangerous and uh, aggressive ideology, was not Christian. The Protocols is so entrenched that when Tsar Nicholas receives the results of an official government inquiry revealing that the Protocols is a hoax, no one seems to care. Tsar Nicholas writes, drop the Protocols. One cannot defend a pure cause by dirty methods, but the damage has already been done. When the Russian government is overthrown by Bolshevik revolutionaries in 1917, the invented prophecy in the protocols seems to come true. Then, on July 16, 1918, the Tsar and his entire family are executed by Bolshevik revolutionaries. And what the royal family leaves behind gives the anti-Semites even more justification for their growing reign of terror. Immediately following the assassination of the Russian royal family in the summer of 1918, an officer arrives at the murder scene to conduct an investigation. Among the family's possessions, he claims to discover only three books, the Bible, War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, and The Great in the Small by Sergei Nilas, the appendix of which includes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And this connection between the Protocols and the execution of the Romanovs spreads like wildfire among the Tsar's surviving right-wing loyalists. When the Protocols of the Elders of Zion come up, at the passage from Tsarist to Bolshevik uh, Russia, and all kinds of uh, Tsarist and uh, right-wingers are fleeing the, the country, and where do they go? They try to go uh, in Europe, uh, 
Germany, France, uh, to these places. And uh, uh, it would not be astonishing that some carry in their luggage a, uh, not only some souvenirs of their household, but also carry with them a, a, a Russian version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which for them is like no, a, a new gospel. Among the legions of royalists fleeing into Europe is Fyodor Vinberg. And if the Protocols is a disease, Vinberg is typhoid Mary. In 1920, Vinberg settles in Berlin and turns the Protocols over to Gottfried Zurbeek, who publishes the first editions of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion in German. It is an immediate bestseller and is reprinted five times within the first two years. And this is an age of crisis. Uh, the end of World War I, massive bloodshed, the uh, dynasties disappearing, forms of government changing, borders changing, manners, morals. All of these things were very upsetting to a lot of people. After the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the anti-Bolsheviks tended to look at the Bolsheviks as Jews, and that gave great credibility to the Protocols when they were noted a few years later. Aha, uh -huh. this terrible revolution has been fomented by Jews as a step towards implementing their control of the world. And Germans, still reeling from the effects of World War I, are easily swayed by the fallacious argument that if the Jews could do it to Russia, they would do it to Germany next. The Germans were also a particularly easy target because they already had a long tradition of anti-Semitic literature, conditioning readers to regard Jews as a threat to civilization. Perhaps the most virulent example is the 1878 edition of Deutsch Schriften, or German Writings, by Paul Boddicher. Boddicher blames the Jews for all the modern ills afflicting Germany. The only solution he tellingly suggests must be the extermination of the Jews. And so it is easy for the spreading virus of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to infect a weakened host. And once the disease of Jewish hatred consumes Germany, it grows stronger and spreads throughout Europe. On May 8, 1920, large excerpts from the Protocols are published in a Times of London editorial. The editorial asks rhetorically, what are these protocols? Are they authentic? If so, what malevolent assembly concocted these plans and gloated over their exposition? Have we, by straining every fiber of our national body, escaped a Pax Germanica only to fall into a Pax Judaica? And that editorial had great importance. It legitimated the protocols. It meant these were not just the ravings of some uh, protest movements in Germany, but that the august Times of London said there's truth to this. Shortly after their publication in London, Winston Churchill, Britain's young war minister, tells the illustrated Sunday Herald. From the days of Spartacus to those of Karl Marx, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society has been steadily growing. Less than a week after their appearance in England, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion begins to reach the American masses, too, and all because of the single-minded anti-Semitic fervor of one of America's greatest heroes, Henry Ford. Between May and October of 1920, Ford writes a weekly article about the Protocols in his newspaper, The Dearborn Independent, but he doesn't stop there. Henry Ford distributes those articles to his automobile showrooms across the country for the benefit of prospective car buyers. In November of the same year, Henry Ford publishes the protocols and his own anti-Semitic diatribe in a four-volume bound set entitled The International Jew, The World's Foremost Problem. Half a million copies are distributed in the United States, and Ford underwrites the publication of European editions in 16 languages. Asked by the New York World in 1921 why he was publishing the protocols, Henry Ford said, the only statement I care to make about the protocols is that they fit in with what is going on. They have fitted the world situation up to this time, they fit it now. He found an answer to many of the questions he had. Given his means and given his prestige, he was in a position to endorse it and make it available to a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't have seen it. This gave it a legitimacy in American life in the 1920s.
It's not what Ford uh, had to say, basically, but to who he was that is uh, really irrelevant here. Uh, this is a hugely successful, much admired man. And one did not have to read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to say, well, if Henry Ford is backing it this way and losing money uh, in the process, uh, lost uh, several million dollars uh, publishing this, uh, his four-volume book, uh, there must be something to it. Henry Ford's campaign on behalf of the Protocols is a flop in the United States. Americans by and large just do not buy the theory that there is a Jewish world conspiracy. But Ford's vitriol in the international Jew is reaching millions of people in Europe, and rising young politicians are beginning to respond to the lies put forth in the Protocols. In particular, a young man with lofty political ambitions is fascinated with Ford's insistence that the Jewish conspiracy is real. His name is Adolf Hitler. Hitler is said to have had a, uh, a picture of the heroic Heinrich Ford in his bedroom, uh, the millionaire, the self-made man. By 1921, the protocols have been around for nearly a quarter of a century. What started as a hoax perpetrated by one political faction for a very limited purpose is now accepted as fact on two continents. Enter Philip Graves, an enterprising young reporter for the Times of London. Graves is not the first to challenge the authenticity of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, but he is the first to prove that it is a fake by finding the original source from which it was plagiarized. Graves finds a satirical French play that contains the exact language word for word found in the Protocols. But the play was written three decades before the Protocols and has nothing to do with Jews. The exposure of the Protocols as a hoax had great importance. It didn't eliminate the Protocols by any means as a factor, but it moved them out of respectable political society. It, it, if you believed in the protocols, it meant you were at the extremes of the political spectrum. You were a protest movement that would not accept the norms of civilized politics. In England, Churchill recants immediately. In America, Ford does not. It takes six more years for the American Jewish Committee to receive Henry Ford's written apology for his inflammatory articles. But to the day he died, Ford maintained that while the protocols were a fake, what they expose is true. In Germany, this idea is already making history. When the German people were trying to account for the loss in World War I, and they look to the protocols for an explanation. And through the 1920s, the tendency to blame Jews for whatever problem existed grew and grew and grew. And true believers are beginning to turn words into action and action into bloodshed. Thanks to Philip Graves, a reporter at the Times of London, the Protocols is totally discredited by 1921. But shortly after, Walter Rathenau, Germany's Minister for Foreign Affairs, is gunned down outside his home in Berlin. The motive for the killing is directly linked to the Protocols' true believers. The presiding judge at the trial of one of Rathenau's assassins tells the convicted murderer, Behind the murders is the chief culprit. Irresponsible, fanatical anti-Semitism lifts its face with all the means of slander of which that vulgar libel, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, is an example. May the sacrificial death of Rathenau serve to purify the infected air of Germany and lead Germany towards its cure. Germans of conscience hail the judge's ruling as the death knell of the Protocols, but it is not to be. The infection is unstoppable, and little more than 10 years later, Adolf Hitler, the man who idolized Henry Ford, is named the Chancellor of Germany on January 30, 1933. His Nazi party moves from the fringe of German politics to the center of power. And at the very core of their philosophy is the firm conviction that a conspiracy of Jews is undermining the governments of the world. Hitler heard about it quite early in Mein Kampf. He specifically mentions the protocols. He says that 
Of course, the Jews deny it, but that's even more proof that it's true because, of course, they want to conceal this evidence of their sins from the rest of the world. In Mein Kampf, Hitler declares, If the Jew, with the help of his Marxist catechism, triumphs over the people of this world, his crown will be the dance of death for mankind. The Nazi party embraces the protocols as scripture. Like Roosevelt's chicken in every pot, Hitler puts a copy of the protocols in virtually every house in Germany. Only the Bible rivals it in popularity. Now, why did it succeed in Germany? Very simply, because the Germans are readers. They are literate people. And therefore, when it was translated into German and financed by Ford, in Germany, they sold 10 million copies in a few years. It became obligatory reading in the Hitler Jugend uh, uh, movement. They were educated uh, on it. Two months after Hitler takes control, the anti-Jewish rhetoric of the Nazi party becomes the law of Germany. On April 1st, 1933, the Third Reich calls for a national boycott of Jewish-owned businesses. In September of 1935, the Nuremberg Laws are enacted. These strip Jews of their citizenship and give authorities the power to arrest them and ship them out of their communities. And the Protocols is used again and again as justification for such flagrant disregard for human rights. Among those most responsible for keeping the Protocols at the forefront is Julius Streicher, a notorious anti-Semite and a newspaper publisher. Julius Streicher was one of the most unpleasant Nazis. Even his fellow Nazi brethren didn't like him very much. But Streicher had one very strong thing in his favor. He was one of Hitler's few close buddies, if you will. He'd gained that by merging his own political party with Hitler's in 1922, which at that time almost doubled the size of the Nazi movement, and it earned Hitler's lifelong gratitude. Streicher publishes Der Stürmer, a popular right-wing political newspaper. Week in and week out, Der Stürmer's half-million readers are treated to hyperbolic articles about the world Jewish conspiracy. In October of 1938, five years into the Nazis' master plan, the rhetoric in Der Stürmer turns into a call to action. The Jew, Stryker writes, A bacteria, vermin, and pests that cannot be tolerated. For reasons of cleanliness and hygiene, we must make them harmless by killing them off. I'd say that the protocols had a very major impact in moving anti-Semitism from a protest movement to a movement of power. I would not say it was the only factor or that it wouldn't have happened without it, but it was certainly a significant element. The Nazi propaganda machine under Joseph Goebbels keeps up a steady drumbeat of anti-Jewish hatred. Perhaps the most notorious example of anti-Semitic propaganda is a 1940 film entitled The Eternal Jew. At its core, this film tells the story found within the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. It's a pseudo-documentary showing the Jews engaged in all kinds of evil things. They never directly mention the protocols, but the line that Hitler takes in that film is very much influenced by the protocols. For example, it shows the Jews engaged in a sinister campaign to take over the world. They're compared to rats who spread around the world from their origins in Asia. It also does a great deal with the Jews and their financial power. The protocol suggests financially the Jews are going to control the world. The film The Eternal Jew spends a great deal of time doing exactly that. As Hitler's blitzkrieg advances across Europe, country after country falls to the Third Reich. By 1941, the vast majority of European Jews are under Nazi control. One of the darkest chapters in human history begins. One historian said that Germans knew enough to know they didn't want to know any more. But of course, that means you know something. And you've got to have a reason for not wanting to know any more. The protocols were one of those reasons. It was a warrant for closing one's eyes to what was going on. In October of 1943, Heinrich Himmler, 
the chief of Hitler's SS and an architect of the final solution, offers a sobering rationale for the Holocaust. We had the moral duty towards our people to exterminate the people who wanted to exterminate us. By the end of the war, more than six million Jews are dead. The horrific legacy of a fake document that infected the morality of the world. Were the protocols the warrant for genocide? I think the term warrant for genocide is an accurate one. Uh, it was the building block upon which the Nazis extended so much of their ideology. Now, mind you, the Nazis themselves didn't use the protocols originally. They had other, there was so much else in the literature. But when it came along and they became aware of it, they absorbed it and made good use of it. And it probably was more than any other single document. The, uh, the warrant, the justification uh, for the Holocaust. With the Allied victory in Europe on May 8th, 1945, America and the rest of the world sees for the first time what rampant anti-Semitism has done. The theory of a Jewish conspiracy to take control of the world has been circulating since before the birth of Christ. The notion that the Jewish world is like a snake slowly encircling and choking the life and freedom from its prey has been a significant part of the history of hate-mongering. And although one might believe that the Holocaust heightened the world's sensitivity to the dangers of hatred, this is not entirely the case. Like an incurable disease, the protocols have not gone away. Since the end of World War II, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion have reappeared in the United States and elsewhere around the world. Probably the two most prominent areas of the world, other than Europe and the United States, are Japan, and the Middle East. The Middle East, of course, there is an experience with Jews, and particularly with the State of Israel. And the protocols are seen as a way of understanding Israel. The brother of Gamal Abdel Nasser, one of the leading figures of the Arab world, wrote the introduction and sponsored one of the editions of the protocols. So it's very high level, very prominent. It's available free. I myself picked up a copy in the French language in the Saudi Arabian Embassy. They're just giving it away. New editions are published in Portuguese, Arabic, and Swedish. It is featured on many websites, and with the advent of the Internet, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is now more accessible than ever before. And despite the fact that the Protocols is a hoax, very few modern sources mention this fact. The perpetuation of the Jewish conspiracy myth is continued, and the Protocols continue to be cited as a genuine document almost always to support an anti-Semitic agenda. In 1990, a controversy erupts in Los Angeles about the motives for the sale of the protocols and other anti-Jewish writings at a city-sponsored book fair. L.A. City Councilman Zef Yaroslavsky protests the presence of these books at the fair. You've got purveyors of hate out there who will use this as a vehicle to perpetrate their own hateful philosophies. So as long as they're around, we have to counteract it through education, through teaching our kids, uh, uh, and just make it as common knowledge that it's a hoax as they are trying to make it common knowledge that the Jews are an international conspiracy trying to rip everybody off. Writing about the controversy in 1990, NOMO, the black student newspaper published on the UCLA campus, defends the sale of the protocols by invoking the First Amendment. But it never refers to the protocols as a hoax. The article states, many have tried to condemn the book and have it banned on the basis of anti-Semitism before, but to no avail. The fact remains that the protocols have never been refuted. But the protocols has been refuted again and again, and the UCLA reporter didn't need to look any farther than her own law library to find proof. This is a 1964 congressional report condemning the protocols as a fabricated historic document. You can perpetrate all kinds of hoaxes and false nonsense about people if you don't know those people. As a student at UCLA, as an undergraduate, I met a young woman from Long Island who was a colleague of mine in school who said I was the first Jew she met 
and, uh, and she was surprised that I did not have horns. She actually said she looked at my head to see where my horns were. Uh, this is 1968. In fact, it has taken Russia, the birthplace of the protocols, almost a century to condemn the document for what it is. In 1993, a Russian court rules that the protocols are an anti-Semitic forgery. But even this historic proclamation is not enough to stop the hate. You're wondering about whether the protocols could be stopped. The historical record says no. Uh, they keep on popping up everywhere. Uh, the oddest places, Japan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, places that uh, you don't think have a big so-called Jewish problem. A good example is the Norwegian resource page on the World Wide Web. As recently as 1998, this site is publishing the imaginary minutes of a second meeting of the learned elders of Zion, purportedly held on the centennial anniversary in 1997. These forged minutes are even more inflammatory than the original, ending with this quote supposedly from one of the new elders. Finally, we will see the end of this white race. Impressionable white children will have their minds molded into agents of their own destruction. And again, nowhere is it stated that this is a work of fiction. The ability of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to find believers around the world is a sharp reminder of the peril it still poses. Only by examining the historic roots of such infectious beliefs and exposing the monstrous falsehoods from which they spread can we stop hate with truth. This is why we go in search of history.